coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. It's a software object that is tightly connected, paired to its physical counterpart, and it acts as a proxy or as a bridge to the digital world. So what's inside is all the data about the structure, so you know, how is it built, number of parts, you know, what was the blueprint, uh, what is the bit of material, all those kind of things. Then the context in which it operates. And finally, you have the behavior. The digital twin, or software-defined product as I prefer to call it, is the most important tech in IoT, yet you hardly hear anything about it, especially when compared to other IoT techs such as sensing, networking, and analytics. Maybe it's because it's such a new and abstract concept for most people. Well, that's about to change. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with Dimitri Volkman about producing the digital twin for the industrial internet of things. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is for business leaders and managers employing the Internet of Things for their business or the business of their customers. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair, and I interview the industry's leading authorities to find out how they use IoT to improve business and create value. If you like this show, subscribe to it on iTunes and go to iotinc.com to check out my complimentary articles, videos, meetups, and webinars. This is the first in a series of four or maybe five episodes that will focus exclusively on the software-defined product or digital twin, because it's that important. In fact, it's the most important tech in IoT. At the end of this series, I'm hoping you'll have a clear understanding of what it is and how it can be used in your IoT implementation. If you want to learn more about the SDP, my book, IoT Inc., How Your Company Can Use the Internet of Things to Win in the Outcome Economy, dedicates a full chapter to it. But not only that, it repeatedly refers to it throughout the book. It will also be heavily covered in my upcoming online courses playing a leading role in the business course, the strategy course, and the technology course. With that, let's get on with the show. Oh, a quick note. Something went wacky with the interview recording software, so it kind of had to be patched together in post. Other than my voice sounding kind of weird and the timing being off, well, slightly off in some places, you're really going to enjoy the show. With me today on the IoT show is Dimitri Volkman. Dimitri is a software executive with a history in IT platforms and expertise in bringing together product management and product marketing in order to deliver products to the market successfully. At GE Digital, Dimitri is leading digital twin thought leadership and product marketing on the Predix platform. Dimitri, welcome. Welcome, Bruce. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. So, so how would you compare an IT platform with an IoT platform? Well, that's a that's a vast subject. So, uh, um, I think the, the the way I think about it, and uh, and this is actually what drove me to uh, IoT initially, mm -hmm. because uh, as you said, I I had a long career in platforms, starting in databases, going client server, internet, everything, and so on. And uh, at some point, I realized that what we've been doing in the past five decades was we made things disappeared. You know, we virtualize the world. No mm -hmm. more purchase orders, no more music, you know, as a LPs or no more, you know, 70 millimeter film. Everything was becoming digital, but was making things disappear. When I look at the physical world, you're not going to make the system disappear. So it's really about creating a, a digital representation connected to that physical system so you can bridge it or integrate it into the digital world. So I realized that was a very different type of, of, of technology that we needed for that. And so that's the fundamental difference. So the IoT platforms have to deal with creating you know, a sort of proxy to the physical world and maintaining that connection. That's fundamentally what is different. 
So the you're saying in the IT world, you're working in the digital, and then in the IoT world, you need to have that proxy so you can work within kind of the same mechanisms as IT. Is that right? Yeah, and, and the, the, because the anchor is in the physical world, so the, the, the machine is still there, but you need to have this access to the machine through a proxy. And it actually b- go both ways. This is where the origin of you know IoT in terms of sensors and actuators mm. comes. Mm. So sensors give you information, but you can also send commands to those machines. That's right. You can actuate the physical world, kind of like a transfer of, of, of uh, energy, right? You're kind of trans- yeah some world energy into a digital or you're transforming the digital into some world energy. Well, yeah. why, don't, why don't we start with a little bit about you and your background in IoT? Just bring us up to date. Yeah, so I mean, as I mentioned earlier, about probably four, five, six years ago, I realized that you know there was this big change coming because we were going after the physical world. We had pretty much optimized, you know, whatever you can do in terms of what we call systems of records or systems of engagement. And I thought, well, yeah, there is something interesting there. Now, my my second level of thinking was uh, because if you look at IoT today, you have consumer and you have industrial. And uh, when I looked at consumers, I figured out well. It's probably be an extension of capturing data about you know users and maybe automating their homes. But if I look at industrials, you know there are pockets of productivities, there are optimization of the systems itself and on the operation that have a much broader opportunity in terms of digitalization. Because to be perfectly honest, there's a lot of things that can be done in the industrial world from a digital standpoint because this world has been disconnected from the internet for many times and it's now suddenly embracing internet yeah so it sounds like then it's been around four years then that you've been has it been at ge that you've been for the four years in iot or have you did you start elsewhere no, I started as a consultant uh, when I came out of the mobile world. The, the mobile technology has actually has been a bridge for me because you can argue that mobile things, you know, a little bit of that. So I did a bit of consulting initially on that, uh, a few startups in the medical space, and I joined G uh, about a year and a half ago now. Now, had you, we're going to talk obviously uh, today about the digital twin or the software defined product. Had you heard about this concept before joining GE? I have to be honest, no. So, but uh, I actually fairly quickly uh, got uh, into the digital twin at GE. And, and, and actually, it might be interesting to, 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 to mention that. Uh, I said earlier, what we've done initially is, 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 is go after, you know, basically records and we digitalize them. And there is some literature uh, on the market that explains why we build systems of record. And the key technology for that was the relational database. Then when the internet came in, we started to connect people to those systems and we started to build what we call system of engagement. And the key technologies at that time were, you know, search, uh, messaging, uh, those kind of things. Now, if you look at the world of physical thing, there isn't yet a concept of systems of assets. And I think it's emerging now, and the key technology in the systems of asset is going to be the digital twin. So that's the evolution of the progression, if you want. No, yeah, no, that's interesting. Well, why don't we? That's interesting. So starting first with with strictly, yeah, just information, strictly so records that is holding information, then bringing people and folding them into the information technology, and then we're now saying do the same thing with physical assets, right? I mean, into information technology. I mean, IoT and I and IT, they are both, you know, if you think about it, all incremental value of an IoT product comes from transforming data into useful information. So IoT really is an information technology, but like you say, the difference between them now is is going from people and records to assets, or would you even, would you go a little bit further than that? I, I think it's you know it's 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 quite right. The the other angle you have to think about is that when we said physical, actually, we we basically said you know at a very high level something that has a structure operating into a context and as a behavior. So it can be applied to machine, but interestingly enough, it can be applied to you know, human being as well. So what is different is actually the, 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 the dynamic aspect. You know, if you think about a financial transaction, you know, it lasts a millisecond, then you store it somewhere and you actually don't want it to change at all for compliance reasons and those kind of things. If you think about the physical system, it's going to continue to generate data. Now you want to accumulate those data and also not change them, but there is this dynamic pairing aspect aspect of something that behaves and lives that is very different from what we've been doing earlier in the digitalization uh, years, if yeah, you want. No, and I think that that's absolutely correct. And when people, you know, kind of ask me, what's the difference between a model 
you know, a typical model, and we've had models, you know, in, in, in pretty much all different uh, fields, and then an IoT model is, I think, you know, I do point to that is that in an IoT model, like you said, it's being, it's alive, and right, and so it's being constantly being updated, both uh, just becoming more accurate and then constantly being used. And so that is a, would you say that's a good way of kind of differentiating the two types of models? Yes, I would, I would agree with, I would, I would totally agree with that. And, and I think we, we will talk about that later on, but we see that, and I won't maybe say that up front, you know, the digital twin is, is a still a term and a concept which is in flux in terms of definition. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people tend to sometimes associate it to a model, but it's not just right. a model. It's really the accumulation of all the data and the, the, the intelligence you can build on top of that. And the reason I'm saying that it's, it's very important to understand that there is a, there's a life cycle aspect. So when you look at physical system and industrial system, you, know, you start with an idea. Oh, I'm going to build a better machine for that. Then you design it. Then you build it. Then you start running it and operating it. You service it for a certain amount of time. And you finally, you decommission it. So all along that cycle, you accumulate data and you can do predictions and you run it. But at the end of that cycle, actually, the re there is residual value of all this data and intelligence because you've accumulated all that. And, and, and when we talk about platform, we'll see that it's very important because you can use all that historical data of those systems to do simulation to create the next generation. So there is this overall holistic aspect of aggregating data and intelligence all across the life of a system, which is a fairly new concept. Yeah, and I want to get in the simulation, but let, let's just start with the basics. Um, in your view, then, what is a digital twin? So I think there are, there, are, there, are, there are four major components to think about. First of all, it's an enablement technology. So you, you have to understand that. And, and, and there are different terms. You can think about it. You're a software model with data, as I said, or a software construct or a software object. But it's really important is what I said in the beginning of the discussion. So it's a, 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 a software object that is tightly connected, paired to its physical counterpart, and it acts as a proxy or as a bridge right. to the digital world. So that's the I would say level one high level thing. Now, what's inside? What's inside? So what's inside yeah. is all okay. the data about the structure. So you know how is it built, number of parts, you know, what was the blueprint, uh, what is the bit of material, all those kind of things. Then the context in which it operates. And context is very broad here. It's obviously, you know, temperature, pressure, location, but it's also is a financial model. Uh, has there been some service records about that? You know, has there some specific expectation? And finally, you have the behavior. So is it running? What's the cur current, you know, performance indication? Uh, can I send comments to it? So that's the data aspect. And then you begin intelligence on top of this data, specifically analytics, predictions, early warning. So that's the element. Now, at the end of the day, what do you get from that? Well, whenever you need anything about the past and present performance of that system, you go to Digital Twin. And when you want to have predictions, you also or early warnings, you go to Digital Twin. So you can very well imagine a sort of dialogue uh, using this software construct, and, and this is why it can be used in different type of interface, whether it's UI, VR, or voice. And you would set, you would go to a digital twin and say, "Oh, when were you created? Uh, what is your blueprint? Uh, when will you start the first time? What are your most critical? What are your most critical components? When was this component service? Uh, when is it likely mm -hmm. to have a failure in the coming two weeks or six weeks? All those kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think you could even look in the present, right? You know, like. Oh, yeah, of course. What's going on now? Are we within tolerances and so forth? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I have to tell you, you know, my personal opinion is I don't I do not like the term digital twin, mostly because it kind of to me, it, it connotes a, a physical representation. And like you said, it can be more than just a physical representation. It, it could be a biological representation, a chemical one, a financial one, an economic one. And so so. I like I like software defined product, and I think you kind of said that, and, and it consists of a model, and then the application that goes around it. Would, how would that how would that fit in your in your thinking? Does that kind of fit in fit in the right way? 
Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and, and believe it or not, you know, uh, amongst the, 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 the few people that think about, you know, digital twin uh, years ago, and it's actually now increasing significantly, there are a lot of debate and discussions. Mm-hmm. I, I do agree that the twin is, because the problem with twins is if you separate yeah. them at birth, they go in different directions, <laughs> and, you don't, and you really don't want to do that. So uh, uh, some analysts uh, like Gardner have been using the concept of digital entities. But the thing is that there is market momentum about digital twin right now. Exactly. So. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an anecdote here. Uh, when, when I start looking at digital twins in the beginning of 2016, I set up a Google alert on digital twin, and I was I was getting like you know one hit or two hits. Uh, I would say every other week. Nowadays, I'm getting one every day. Yeah. So yeah, so, it, it's, so it's definitely and I you know I'm kind of the same way I, because twin to me is a you know is a is is a matching and I know it doesn't just have to be physical but generally you know it's a matching but I like to think of it as a simulation right I mean that's maybe a, a better for people listening right now like what's the digital twin I mean you gave a really good a really good description of uh, of it at a high level and then what's inside of it but really what we're talking about is a simulation aren't we well, I, I wouldn't go that far because it's, you know, in an ideal uh, you know, world uh, when, when platform matures and when the technology is there, it will be the mm. exact, you know, again, the proxy mm. to the physical system. Uh, you can imagine a state where, you know, if you want to have information about a running system, you go to the twin or you go look at it yourself, you're going to have exactly yeah. the same information. To the fidelity so, of the data, so right? simulation is Exactly, fidelity of the data. So, and especially, especially in the industrial world, usually the way we talk about simulation is uh, is when we actually look at, well, you know, I'm designing the next generation of this system, and I want to simulate it before I actually build it. Because again, think about it in terms of the cycle. You know, the digital twin cycle before the physical system exists. So you start, you know, modeling that system. And this is actually the origin of the, if you look at the origin of the digital twin, it was created for that purpose. So before I build the physical system, I create a digital model and I have existing data about past performance and I run this data through those models to figure out it's going to work. So you have to keep that, that mind, that, that uh, concept in mind. So when you refer to simulation in the context of digital twin in industrial, a lot of people will think, oh yeah, it's uh, when you're doing okay. CAD models. Uh, I want to make sure that before I beat yeah, it, yeah. it's going to no, work. I'm more in a general, right? A general term. Um, yeah. But but let let's yep. talk about the the underlying technology a little bit here, because I well I, I like to understand the digital twin um, with respect to GE. What is the mathematical foundations below it? What type what what type of math is it? So. Uh, Again, there are, there are two things there, and and uh, and and what is interesting to, to to answer this question more properly is again if you go back to the mm-hmm. cycle of you know design, build, uh, service, operate, and service. Uh, initially, we started to uh, to do uh, digital twins for the design and build, obviously, but this is something that is much more internal because this is our factory, so we don't necessarily communicate about that. So you will see other vendors in the market talking much more about this aspect, but we've doing it for many many years. For what we are known as G is much more on the operate and service because you probably know very well but G uh, to some extent stopped selling engines years and years ago we don't sell engines anymore we sell proportion services so we sell the engine we do the maintenance on it so now in order to do that we started to instrument our systems our machine and we build a lot of algorithmics and a lot of uh, analytics and and actually physics mm-hmm. is one very important things in the in the digital twin for 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 physical systems so it's a combination it's, again it's a bundle of data about the structure you know how many parts mm-hmm. are they organized the context in which it operates, then the readings you can have, and then you apply sophisticated analytics and machine learning on top yeah, of that. And, and and I guess fundamental to this is statistics, right? I mean, what we're doing is we're bringing in data points. We're trying to make a more and more accurate model. So talk to us a little bit about how statistics play into this. Well, it's a, it's a fundamental element, and it's, and it's actually a, a pretty tight to the platform because the idea is that you start with what we call, uh, there are different terms for that, but, but some people say the digital twin class, uh, some of us use the idea of a, of a digital twin uh, uh, prototype or digital twin blueprint. What it is is that it's this idea of it's the model before it's built. Then when you create, when you have a new system build, you have an instance. 
Now, when you have many different instances of a same asset, well, you can start learning from all of that. So you have the statistics not only at the level of one system itself that you've observed for many years, but many of these systems. And this is where the concept of a platform becomes important because the platform becomes a learning system. So you capture not the data about that specific engine, where you can do statistics, but the data about all the different engines, and you can do statistics across the fleet if you want. So that's a very important element of the value of the platform because you can't do that with individual digital twin running on different you know, software stacks. You have to centralize all that data in order to build more intelligence. No, and, that, and that's a good point is effectively looking at it from a micro or a macro point of view. You know, you could simulate, let's use simulate for lack of a better word, um, a particular part, how a part is working. Then you could do the same thing for the product. But what we're talking about here is for the system of, of multiple products. And that's where that's where the digital twin concept kind of separates a little bit is and I don't know if there's yet a word for this and maybe you can maybe you can fill in the blanks but then when we're talking about bringing together multiple digital twins that's what you're talking about on the platform level and what what's the what's the concept behind that is there is there something analogous to digital twin for the system and like the entire environment well, there's debates about that, and I, and I, and I, and I think that I, I have a slightly different position because, to some extent, I think what we and if I go back to what we've done in information technology in the past, you know, decades, we've gone very good at doing workflow optimization, you know, at orchestrating things to, in order to optimize them. So you could say, oh, why can't we just do that very easily for IoT? Well, the problem is we do not have that reliable high fidelity access to, again, the state, the current state, the future states, and the potential uh, the, the potential future states. So the idea is that the digital twin really becomes that object that gives you all the information, past, present, and predictions, so that you can orchestrate them and optimize workflows. But I would say that these optimization of workflows, they are no different from you know, optimizing a, a business process you know, in, in a company. So I kind of separate the two. This is why I said you know, the essence of the twin is to give you the proxy to the physical system. And then as you have proxies of all those digital, those, those physical sorry, things, you can then apply classic you know, workflow optimization models to make them work better. Is that happening in the IoT world? Is that in the platform and is it called something in particular? Well, some people actually call it digital twin of processes. I, I personally do not no, like that because I would say, well, these are models. No. Yeah, so so it's it's model. You know, the the thing is, you know, and, and that's true across the board. If you look at you know other domains, uh, with, with especially with data science and, and machine learning catching up, you know, or growing very fast nowadays, there's a lot of you know, sort of model based development. So you apply a model to optimize things. And again, the the, the key thing in IoT is how do I get the reliable, uh, uh, high fidelity data so that I can optimize properly. And that's what the yeah. twins okay. give you. Well, let, let's shift away from the what into the how. So how are digital twins used in IoT today? Yeah. So uh, uh, just to preface, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here, but uh, because the, when I engage in a conversation about digital twins, uh, especially talk about models and simulation, uh, you get a lot of people, and especially the business guy tells you, oh, yeah, yeah, right, modeling, exactly. modeling for the sake of modeling. Yeah, by the time I'm done modeling, you know, my business is out. <laughs> so uh, the, idea, the idea with the twin is we actually look at the outcome right. we are trying to achieve. So we design the twin by looking at the outcome. And usually the outcomes are defined by looking at the most critical parts or the most critical failure modes. So let me give you a couple of examples. One example, which is actually actually uh, a public uh, on one of the the, the, the G engines, uh, the G90, is that if you look at the jet engine, there are very uh, critical parts, which are the blades, and especially the blades that are in the turbine. So the turbine is after the combustion chamber. So those blades, as you can imagine, they are, they are operating in conditions where you know, it's, it's thousands of degrees in temperature. So what we do on those blades is we put what we call a thermal coating. So it's a sort of a special paint to make the blades much more resistant. Now, as we operate engines and, and maintain them, we realize that the engines that fly in the Middle East, where the air you know, is hot and sandy, compared to the ones that operate in the Pacific North, have totally different you know, failure modes because 
the blades were totally differently. So the first thing we do is because we have digital twins of all those blades and we know where those engines operate, we can optimize, we can know when we have to maintain the different engines. So we look at each different engines and we say, well, this one's going to be maintaining, you know, in one month because it's flying there and this one can wait another six months because it's flying there. So that's the level one at the, at the level of the assets. Now, once you have this information, you can start optimizing your operation. So you can start saying, oh, you know what? Uh, actually, I don't have a shop where I can service that engine in the Middle East. So I'm going to reroute that plane. So it's going to fly three months in the North Pacific because it's going to wear slower. So you can start doing those kind of optimization at your operation level. Again, because you have the information at the asset level, that comes from the digital twin. And, and we're talking tens of millions of dollars of saving per year for an airline in these kind of scenarios. So you're saying, so this is so this particular example, it's using the digital twin for a operational, operational optimization, right? Yeah, initially asset optimization. And once you can optimize the asset, obviously you can optimize the operation. Okay. And we see most of our customers going to that. There's another interesting example that I want to give you, which is, uh, which is in the, in the, in the um, uh, power generation, electricity generation. And we, we don't have that in production yet, but it's coming now. We have started to have models so that we can really predict when we need to do the maintenance for those big uh, you know, power generation turbines that we have. And, and those assets are you know, very valuable. So when you turn them off, you lose a lot of money. So, for example, we had an example at the, in the, in the uh, South California where you obviously know that the demand for electricity is very strong during the summer. So through a prediction system, we realized that, oh, that specific uh, turbine is likely to fail in dry. So, and the maintenance was scheduled for October. So we're going to move the maintenance in May. So no big deal. You would say, well, classic optimization. Now, here's the problem. When you shut down such a machine, you don't just change the problematic part. You do a whole lot of set of you know, changes and replacing of fluids and all those kind of things. So the customer will say, well, you're anticipating the maintenance from October to May, which means you're going to change a whole lot of parts that are not at the end of their life. So it's the cost mm -hmm. uh, element because you do the maintenance earlier. Now, because we have models of the other parts, we can tell that customers, well, you know what? Between now and May, you can actually beat up your machine. You can go out of spec because we know we can accept more wearing on these other parts. So again, it's that optimization between the different, you know, lifing model. Lifing is one, we call that lifing. So mm -hmm. prediction on the life of a model is one of the most, you know, effective way to uh, optimize and save money. There's obviously the failure mode because you don't want things to break, but but being able to understand when you're reaching the end of life is what has the biggest economic impact. So now are you referring, are you moving now from efficiency to maintenance and, and then looking at, you know, this end of or failure mode, trying to prevent that failure mode with, let's say, a predictive maintenance uh, type application? Yeah, it's it actually usually goes the other way around. You know, the, the first thing, like, the progression is the following from our customers. The first things they usually do is what we call uh, equipment health. So you look at, you know, how is it running? Is it within specification? Is everything fine? Then you look at failure modes, which goes you into maintenance optimization. And now that you do maintenance optimization, you have a much better hand on when you need to stop your machines. And then you can go into operation optimization. And the end goal is always the same. You know, the, the, the sort of the, the growl, if you want, in, uh, in industry is uh, uh, no unplanned downtime. Because when you have something that breaks when you don't want it, that's the worst case scenario. So the no unplanned dying time is sort of the, the what we are all looking at, you know, in delivering. Okay, so equipment health failure mode, and, and you were implying there was a third. But then you go to a third one, or is is that the order there? Yeah, well, equipment health failure modes, maintenance, and operation optimization. So operational um, optimization is what you're saying is the last one. And by the way, the, the next step, and I don't think we're there yet in most of industries, but the next step is, well, you're going to have opti uh, ability to create new business model because now that you have, you know, I would say, the full visibility of, again, past and present condition of your system and the predictions of what might happen, you can start inventing you know, new ideas. You can start maybe monetizing that because you have a lot of data about how a certain type of equipment function. So you can put that on the market and sell it to other people that are trying to do similar things like that. So we haven't seen that phase of a you know, reorganization of the industry, I would say, 
with maybe the exception of uh, of the automotive industry because the uh, automobile industry with Tesla going electric has really transformed the industry. But you, I believe personally that we're going to see that in the future in other industries because you know when you know exactly when a power generation come come from different sources, let's say you know solar, wind, or burning gas, you can go on the marketplace and say, you know what, in four hours I need more more power. Who can give right. me that? No, yeah, and I, and I think what you're talking about is you know, extending the instrumentation or the sensing beyond just the physical assets. Because once you can start sensing parameters that are important to your customer's business, that is when you can start doing this business model innovation. And, and yeah, it, it's just really, there's not just a limit to sensing for the product or the asset or the, or the, or the operations, right? I mean, we, we have our products yeah. out there in the world. We can sense other things too. Exactly. Yeah. And I think this is where, again, the platforms are important because this ability to provide those services about what you do on a digital platform and being able to selectively open that to different partners to create new models is going to be very important. We went through that in the e-commerce world. You know, we started with, with monolithic websites and now, you know, most, you know, e-commerce website allows you to create your own boutique or to type into different services or recompose them. So the same thing is going to happen in the industrial world. It's just early. Well, let's start moving into that platform, but maybe just before we get there, or maybe this is going to get us there, let's talk about how the digital twin is developed. So how is it developed, and then, and then how is it integrated into the end product? So the... There are different personas, if you want. Uh, the, the the first, uh, uh, I would say, the persona is the, the 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 experts of these assets, because only the people that build those system can actually understand it and, and and find out what are the real important outcome, and basically create it what we call that digital twin class, if you want, um, uh, or, or blueprints. Yeah, yeah. Usually we look at the outcomes and uh, based on the expertise that you have of the asset. So you have to be the asset expert. Now, what is very important is that, and that's sort of, you know, this is changing in the market now, but initially it, the digital twin was sort of an end to end. So you will take the experts, you look at the assets, you will program all those rules, you will put that into a, uh, an application, then you will start building the application and you will have an application for maintenance, but your digital twin will be prisoner of that application if you want. So it would be designed for one specific purpose. Purpose. So what most platforms are trying to do right now is to disconnect the two. So on one side, the experts do this hard job of bundling data intelligence, and then that digital twin runs on the platform, has API, and any developer can go talk to it and say, okay, what are you? Uh, what can you tell me about your past? What can you tell me about your present? What can you tell me about your future? And then create their own apps. Yeah. So there is this sort of development paradigm is shifting a little yeah, bit right I, now. I like using the analogy of, and you tell me if this is if this rings true for you, but I like when explaining this using the analogy of a let's say a video game and then a player. So let's say we have a basketball game that we're playing. The intelligence that you were talking about, or you know that you know, to uh, embody with the program rules or this asset exper expert. They would provide a player with, you know, how he jumps, maybe let's say it's a basketball game, how he jumps, his accuracy, and that would be encapsulated within the player. And then the application is kind of the game. So then it, it has, you know, different players are, are there. There's maybe different conditions in the environment. And so that's, again, you know, kind of this model and application wrapped around it. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, it's it's a very good way to think about it. I, I totally agree. It's a very good way to think about it. And, and by the way, the interesting point you're making here is that you know people might not necessarily realize, but there are digital twins of players in gaming system. We just don't call them that way, but these are digital yeah. twins. Yeah, they're so. simulate. I mean, you effectively again, and I think the important point that you're bringing here is. Um, is encapsulating the the characteristics of the player or the part into that model, and then you wrap it with an app, and then you can put that model into different applications, right? And and this can be the different yeah. applications. If you can reuse that same model, the player, the 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 turbine, and put it into different environments, the application, then you've got a lot more power. And this is that separation, I think, that yeah. you're talking about, isn't it? 
exactly that's exactly that separation and, and the way you have to do it today it is you know there's enough examples of uh, of the success of that is that you have to do it in a way that is api driven so you can trigger an ecosystem so uh, that's that's no different from what we've been doing in the it systems um so that's that, yeah that's and it's a very important uh, a concept and it's actually it's it, it's interesting because if you got the industrial world which is used to uh doing end to end solution it's actually a slow move because the temptation to build those models and to hide them into your app because exactly. it's your system and your app is still very high. And, and to be very honest, I think there is a lot, still a lot of debates about that in the whole industry. And I don't think we've reached the level of maturity yet where it's crystal clear for everybody. But I think this is something you're going to see evolved uh, in the coming, uh, in the coming uh, probably years. And, and, you, and I personally predict that you're going to see some vendors that don't get it. They're going to start to keep on being proprietary. And some that do get it and really trigger an ecosystem. And this one will survive. I think the other one will die. No, I agree with you, Dimitri. And, and I think for everyone listening, this is an important point. And, and my view is really just a business one. When you develop these models, this is going to be intellectual property for your company. And if you do, let's say that you want to move platform or let's say the platform vendor goes out of business or changes their mind, you need to maintain that intellectual property independent of the platform. Right, Dimitri? And so this is just, a, I think, just in general, a, a good practice to separate, to do the separation, as you were saying. And it's not like it's new, right? I mean, this concept of software compartmentalization um, is something that we can apply to this new area of IoT pla- uh, IoT platforms and the models that are running on them. But it's it's just a best practice, just in general, don't you think? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I totally agree with that. And and I think you're touching. You know, I, I don't want to digress too much, but but you're touching on a very interesting point. I believe, which is, uh, I mean, mid-term and long-term, going to be a great opportunity, because if you think about it, that concept of you know the value of the data as the raw data capture and the value of the data transformed through the algorithm, this is what's going to become the intellectual property. And you can very well imagine platforms that will be, give you the ability to manage that. You know, uh, the, the, the classic example uh, that we, which is actually uh, inspired from a panel uh, that I, uh, that I observe where you have uh, somebody from G uh, 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 with somebody from an airline and saying, Oh, you know, it's my engine, it's my data. And the airline will say, oh, your engine is on my plane, so it's my data. And then you have the service company, because most airlines subcontract their servicing to a company, say, hang on a second, I have a contract with you, I'm responsible, it's my data. And then shows the leasing company, which says, you know what, guys, I'm providing the capital to buy those airplanes. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. And, and it's not over, because you have the insurance guy that said, you know what? If there's a liability problem, I'm the one paying. So, and the point is not, you know, there's no, my point is that there is no clear yes or no who owns the data answer. So, because it can be spread around and shared between the different vendors. So, there's going to be a need for platform to manage who has access and who can remonetize and resell the value of those data and the data transform on top of that. So, it's a very interesting long term view from a business standpoint. You know, and, I, and I agree. And, and I think, you know, even. Sh- you know, it is from a long-term point of view, and it's also a risk management issue in the short term. Well, short, mid, depends, right? You don't know when. But I think just what we're saying, and we're both nodding our heads here, is that this separation of model and then the application that it's within or this separation of this knowledge and the environment that it's in is super important. And I think it's something that you need to look at when choosing a platform to make sure that these things aren't conflated, they're not mixed up. And this is something I'm trying to do in this series right now is just to understand, you know, the digital twin, but more importantly, how do you how do you develop it and how is it related to the platform? Because you don't want it all mixed up. And I think we've kind of accidentally just sort of tripped over this, but it is one of the main points I think I think that's super important to make here. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. And, and it's going to be difficult in the beginning because, you know, if you take the analogy of, you know, relational databases, you know, when we started with relational databases, you had different type of SQL and you were pretty much tied into the platform you were choosing. And this is going to happen in the beginning for Digital Twin. Now, over time, you know, standards and interoperability develop. So you can now have a data model and you can implement it on Oracle database and it's fairly easy to move it to a 
you know, IBM database. So we're not there yet in the industry because right now the platform are still going to be very lock-in and proprietary. But you're definitely right. You need to keep that in mind. But again, if you keep this approach where you separate, okay, who provides the expertise and understand the assets and I make sure I capture that knowledge well and now who consumes it, if you already do that, you're on the right track. And as platform evolves to manage both, you will have more freedom. So, But you definitely have a great point here. And, uh, and uh, there, there is going to be a battle, I believe, for digital twin platforms, the same way that we had a battle for reassured database platforms. Well, let's talk about what that means. So what's the nitty gritty of actually creating one of these digital twins? Is it, is it, is it a modeling language? Is it a, you know, is it a certain type? Are we just using our regular programming languages? Are we doing this on the analytics platforms? Talk about actually creating this, uh, the model that we're talking about here or the digital twin, however you want to approach it. How is it actually, how, how are people creating them? Yeah, it's actually a little bit of all of the above. But uh, at a high level, there's two fundamental aspects. There's the data aspect, which is, you know, data and metadata, I would say, which is, you know, how do I get access to the data? So how do I get, you know, the asset right. model? And, and keep in mind that, you know, there are machines, and actually most of industrial systems were not designed with digital twin in mind. They were either designed with an on-off switch and we added some sensor later, or they were designed with control system. But control system was there to control them. They were not there to understand the asset. So there's a lot of reverse engineering happening there. And, and we actually actually have uh, interesting uh, machine learning techniques for that. But let's not digress. So there's first, there's the data. I need to be able to understand the structure of the asset and I need to be able to get the sensor data and get the get the, the, the actuator data. And I probably need to be able to integrate that with other systems because the, the, the uh, service records are probably in an ERP system. The bill of material might be in an SAP database somewhere. So there's a whole aspect of data integration. And, and that's not you. It's just you know, a little more complicated because there are different sources. But you have to first you know, aggregate, federate all this data. Now, once you have the data, you have to persist it and you have to persist it you know, dynamically and constantly because sensors are generating data. So there you go into the whole edge to cloud, you know, which data do I filter on the edge, which one do I send to the cloud, which one do I dedupe. So there's a whole data aspect. Now, I have the data in a place where I can start building intelligence. So building intelligence can be as simple as you know, just building simple KPIs, you know, uh, doing simple statistics, getting into algorithm, getting into data science, getting into machine learning. So that's the sort of the techniques. And we, we, you, you, we see people using all kinds of languages, you know, MATLAB, R, Python, C, whatever. So there's not you know, a language of choice for that. What is interesting to point out in the industrial world is that there is one more aspect which is very unique, is the physics aspect. Mm -hmm. So we use a lot of physics. And, uh, and I give you an example. Let me ask you a simple question. How many sensors do you believe there are on the jet engine? <laughs> I know this is a trick question, but let's say 1,000. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So most people will say a lot. And, and actually, you and I talked about there's only uh, 16 or 19. And the reason for that is you know, an engine operates in very harsh conditions. You cannot put a temperature sensor in a combustion chamber. It will blow up in a millisecond. <laughs> now, because we understand material science, because we understand the thermodynamics, we can actually use physics to generate virtual sensors. So we take the raw data and we complement that by virtual sensor data, analyzing signals and extracting basically signal, uh, signal from noise. So there's a whole practice around that which is very unique to industrial elements. So now once you have, you know, those algorithms, those physics models, those machine learning, it's about combining that. And again, the re you combine that for a specific outcome. You said, you know what, there are five important parts. I want to understand how those parts were. So in order to understand that for that part, oh, I'm going to use this machine learning algorithm, but I also need this data and I need to correlate that with this service record. So that's the kind of the way you do it at a very high level. Can you give us a little bit more, uh, fill that in a little bit more, Dimitri. So, in which area in the in the building of the analytics? No, no. Once so, the analytics. Now you're you're now saying relating it, uh, taking that analytics and 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 I think you went you were going 
in the direction of, of going at a higher level representation of it. Is that is that where you were kind of moving? Like once you once you figure out what the models are, and, and let's just be clear, what the models are are simply just the algorithms, and we'll even take it even further down. Let's say it's just an equation that fits the data in a very good way, right? So once – Yeah. So that, you know, just to demystify things, that's all it really is. It's going to be an equation. Okay. And it fits the data in a way for your particular application of it. But I think you were going to go beyond – were you going to go beyond that at a higher level, or, or is that kind of the where it stops? Yeah. The, the, the thing is actually what we try to do to make it really valuable for our customers is actually go a little bit the other way around. So we look at an asset and we say, okay, this asset, we need to know its current condition, which means parameter one, two, three, four, five. And then we go figure out the data and the transformation we need right. to do. Second thing we say, say, oh, there are six critical parts because these are the ones that fail. For these six critical parts, I want early warnings. So now, what kind of part it is? What kind of material science apply? Mm-hmm. What kind of data do I have? What kind of data do I need? Or do I need to do you know, a transformation of the data to extract a signal to noise? And once I have the signal, maybe I need to store the signal and learn from it in the operation. So you, the, the idea is that you look at the outcome, and then you have a whole set of tools physics formula, math formula, machine learning, a whole bunch of algorithm. We have a catalog of 150 algorithm today and we're adding some every day. So you have this sort of big toolbox. We actually put that on a workbench. And again, the expert of the asset is going to assemble those different pieces in order to deliver a specific outcome. No, I like that. And and I think I think that is the critical point here, everyone, is outcome. Right, Dimitri? I mean, it, it's that yeah. if you look at it in isolation, okay, you know, you can see how it works. But you, but more what's important is looking at it in the context of the application and the context of the use case and how you define that is with the outcome. And I think that's that's, that's, a, that's a super important point. And also, I like, you know, the analogy for everyone listening right now. Dimitri made a very good one. I, I guess it's the way that Predix, uh, Predix thinks about it. But a, there's a toolbox and you've got a lot of different tools that you can apply to your data. They're on the workbench. And correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but you've got the, and, That's you're, right. and you're choosing. And within these, you know, within these toolboxes, they really they're just different algorithms. And again, they can be, you know, you know they're, they're generally going to be some sort of an equation. And since we're collecting discrete data, it's going to be generally statistics based. Although you can put a higher level representation on that, like a physics based model, even let's say a biological one, an economic one. And then, and then you just have all these toolboxes that are sitting on the workbench, and then you just try now. And like Dimitri's saying, um, you then need experts to be able to work, choose from this workbox or these toolboxes on the workbench to see which is the best one, which is the one that fits best. But you can talk, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, machine learning because machine learning is kind of helping in this too, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Well, it's one of the different tools we have available. And uh, the, the interesting thing about you know, machine learning, and, and this is usually why we, we, we combine that with, uh, with, uh, with physics, is uh, uh, especially when you're looking at failure and you look at systems that don't fail, because jet engines don't fail very often, you need different types of machine learning to be able to learn from that. Mm-hmm. So you really need to understand you know, the kind of you know, signal that you will see earlier that will trigger something and use machine learning to figure out a way to extract that and do prediction models. So there's a whole set of different techniques we use there. But I would say that, again, the the machine learning algorithm that everybody uses across the industry are fairly well defined today. There is some research being done, and we do have a group for that to create new ones. But most of the algorithm already exists. What is really important is what kind of feature, what kind of data you select and use, and that's an asset expert element. Uh, machine learning is fairly generic across the board. It's really just you know how you feed it and, and having the richness of the tool. And, and, and fundamentally as well is, how do you know it's right? Mm-hmm. So there's one concept we haven't talked about, which is what we call goal data. So goal data is a set of data that we have accumulated, and we know that if you have all those different inputs or features, if you want, in an algorithm, this is the output you need to have. Because we've measured that, we've mm-hmm. tested that, we know it has been working. So when you have those goal data, it really helps you validate the different models much more quickly. And that's a very intensive uh, uh, re- element research. So I would say that the differentiation on machine learning today is much more on the data sets that you have rather than the algorithms itself. Meaning to, to det- yes, and just to be clear, using the machine learning on the data to derive an algorithm. Isn't that what you, is that what you mean? 
Well, the, 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 the data actually is what, in machine learning, the data is what creates the algorithm, if you sure. want. But your data set, it's only as good as the data set is good. Yeah, yeah and, and I think you're also, in a sense, what you're doing is describing the differences between a data scientist and a data analyst, right? I mean, a data scientist yeah. will put together that workbench, will you know, maybe pull together the right toolboxes on it, we'll make sure it's all working. But you need that analyst, and it's going to be a domain expert, like you said, in whatever area, uh, avi avionics, uh, manufacturing, a particular type of manufacturing, that's going to analyze it and be able to come up with these beautiful, beautiful models. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I don't want to digress, but uh, there's actually, uh, uh, you're pointing out there's a very big debate between data analysts and, and data scientists mm -hmm. you know, in, in the field right now. I actually think that over time, those two are going to merge because you're going to need the people that really understand the data, the metadata centric, and the people that understand those you know, self-learning algorithms, and they will all merge in the end. So it's just a new way to program what, to some extent. The, what's the debate? Well, the debate is whether you take a, a, a pure ah, data model aspect as opposed to, you know, you, you feed the data into the neural, neural network and it will figure out. Oh, you're saying the debate is whether you need a data analyst at all and whether a data scientist can actually yeah. do it? Yeah. Well, well you, have data, well, you have data scientists that would say, well, machine learning is enough. Right. I don't need yeah, anything else. Think. And you have the other guys that, so you need both, yeah, is my yeah. point. Okay, okay. All right. Now, we, we've come up with our digital twin. And just to be clear, it's just an algorithm to describe a certain thing. Now, do we use that inside of our jet engine at all, or is it strictly going to be for a past and future analytics exercise? Or are we using it in the jet engine or in the product itself? Yeah, so let me just be clear here. It's not just the algorithm. It's, you know, it's the data and the intelligence. So it's right. the whole right. digital representation. Right. Yeah, so very, very popular. So, uh, I mean, the, 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 the use case is, again, the... The, I would say that the, it's the pairing between that software construct and the physical system. So you can imagine that you have systems that you know are designed upfront with one because this is what we're doing for new machines. But for older ones, you might not have them, so you might have to build them. So you might have to create that pairing afterwards. So it's still a very early stage. And and you actually point out to a very uh, very important concept here is uh, we have to design our platform in such a way that we can accommodate existing systems, especially in the industry, because you know machines live for 40 years. So we're not going to say to our customers, hey, trash your big machine and buy a new one because it comes with a digital twin. So there is this double aspect of a and you're probably going to have a lot of systems that have very rudimentary digital twin uh, in the coming years because they are existing system and we just don't have the, 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 the drive or the, or the need to digitalize them completely. So we will focus on one or two specific outcomes we want to have from those machines and we spend the energy to create that outcome and make sure it's paired to that specific machine. And this is referring to the, the goal data, right, if you have it or not? And was it goal or was it gold? Uh, no, it's gold. Oh, sorry. Okay, That's yeah, my, so my, gold. So G-O-L-D. So that makes sense. Yeah, so yeah. gold data. Yeah. So if you yeah. have the gold data, uh, you, you don't have the gold data, for example, for an older machine is kind of what you're talking about. So you need to build that gold data, right? Yeah, and, and, and there is, I do believe, uh, from an ecosystem standpoint, there's a lot of opportunities for, for partners to look at those, and actually people that have expertise in those older machines, to look at them and you know, maybe put a bunch of sensors and then use their knowledge to create, build those gold data sets. Absolutely. So the, yeah, no, absolutely. No, I agree. And, you know, it, it kind of takes us again, uh, I think we're, we can go in a lot of different uh, directions of our conversation. But the whole method of data as, well, first of all, let's let's consider data as a new oil. I'm okay with that. I mean, we have to refine it and so forth. But there's now being data, syndicated data repositories where you can buy data. But that's okay. But if it's just a stream of data, we have to talk about this contextualization. And this is kind of where you're going with this gold data in a sense is is – that is really this opportunity that you're talking about, right? It's it's not just getting these streams of data because you have to do something with it. And that's kind of, if you can create the gold data along with the algorithms and so forth that go with it, then you've got some real value that you could use in many different ways. Yeah, it's you're touching on a very interesting point again. And, and it's actually, it's it's that, but it's also... What is also very important is the metadata aspect. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is what we call the asset model again. Because if you look at, uh, this is why I think we're going to see in the coming years a lot of changes in, in a lot of IoT platform. Because the fundamentals of the, the I would say the, 
uh, mass market IoT platform has been, okay, I have a sensor, I connect the sensor, here's the connectivity, I get the data, I put it into a data lake or data ocean or whatever, and then go figure. So I sit in panels where I have a lot of people saying, oh, I have all this data stream, as you said, but how do I figure out what they mean? Mm -hmm. Well, because we don't have the context, and that context is the asset model. You know, where did this data come from? On which part was it? Why was it there? So it's, I, I cannot stress more than that, but the, to me, the, the, because a lot of people think that the, the first entry point to the digital twin is the model because it's the outcome. It is not. It's the asset model. I want to understand what it is because when I know what it is, I can build that intelligence and deliver an outcome. If I just have data streams, you can still figure out stuff with a heavy data science, mm -hmm. but it's going to be much, much more complicated. So if you have that description and understanding of the system, if you have historical data set, gold data set that you built from previous operation or previous system, then you're poised, you're in a very good position to very quickly build digital twins. If you just start from data streams, much, much more difficult. No, and you're bringing up a good point, and, and really you're bringing up the point of application protocol. And that is putting around the contextual data. You capture it at the same time and you and you take it to that data lake, you know, within that data stream. But I think the point you're making and clarify if I'm not understanding it correctly, but you need to have this metadata, which really implies you need to have an application protocol, which really implies that the platform you're going to choose better support these application protocols because you need that contextual data to be able to make this asset model. Now, are, are you t is is that the level that you're talking about? Or are you going up a, a higher level than that too? No, that's that that's that's fundamentally it. That's fundamentally it. Yeah. So there is a there, there's the data aspect, there's the metadata aspect, which is very important, and then there is the analytics. But they're all connected. And if you don't do that, very connected. You know, remember what we did, uh, you know, in the '90s when we started. You know, we had an invoicing system, then we had the billing system, then we had a customer service system, and they all had different definition of a customer. <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, if you look at the banking system, we still it's, it's a master data problem. If you look at the banking systems today, for a bank, you're still an account. You're not a person. Right. Now, they do a great job at hiding that on their website. But when you call them, you realize that every time you want to talk to about your account, they ask you to authenticate. So, and, and my point is that if we do those same mistakes in a IoT space, it's going to be much, much, much worse. Yeah. And it's far more than complicated, it's like you said. I mean, yeah. you save, yeah. I mean, this is a, I mean, this is a key takeaway from this discussion here is the metadata aspect and to capture it. And when designing your IoT product, just make sure that you're not just capturing that data, obviously, but you're, but you're capturing all the contextual information around it. All right. I want to um, yeah. just close things off with three quick questions. And try to, just sure. to, you know, just try to give us the um, the high level. But what's the relationship, just again, to try to just pound home this concept of the digital twin, software-defined product, software construct? What's the relationship between the digital twin and the platform, the digital twin and analytics, and the digital twin and the application? Yeah, so to put it very simple, you know, the digi the, regarding the platform, the platform is where the digital twin lives. Mm -hmm. This is why it's persisted, where it's run. Okay. Regarding the analytics, analytics is the brain of the digital twin. So it looks at the data and it produces outcomes. And finally, the application consumes the value of the digital twin right. and ideally through an API. Absolutely. No, I like that. So, so the, let's talk a little bit more about the platform because I think this is an important, this is an important point is you know, I gen it depends on how you define a platform, but if we're looking at it, let's say an AEP platform, and that's an application, uh, an application in environment, no, an application enablement environment platform, an application, what is it? an application enablement platform, an AEP, there's more than just dumb plumbing, you know, and, and I, and I do make the point quite a bit that the platform is something you should choose at the end because it's middleware and it's supposed to support everything that you've chosen from the value down as opposed to you you don't choose in my view you don't choose a platform and then build everything on top of it you're going to go the other way but i have to talk through the other side of my mouth because we touched on this and, I, and dimitri i think this is something i'd like you to expand on is the platform though does play a pretty big role in bringing together the different digital twins to be able to deliver that that outcome. Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, and I think you know, the, the the difficulty we have if you got the current state of the market is uh, we, we talked about application protocol earlier. Is that there isn't really a I would say the standardized way to create and describe digital twins. So think about it this way. Right. Again, in the re- in the relational database days, we had SQL. SQL gives you a language to create tables, and then you had the language to create records, access records, select records. We don't have that today. So what that forces us to do at this point in time is to go to the next level. So we have to look at the data federation. We have to look at the analytic orchestration. We have to look at the machine learning and assemble all that. So there's a whole lot of work in the middle, which is still going to be to some extent quite proprietary for a little bit of time until we have defined those application protocol where you can start off disconnecting the intelligence of the twin from the the needy, greedy, you know, little low level software components. So, and it's the maturity of the market. So, we're working on that with the Predix platform. Others are doing it. But the reality right now is that disconnecting you know, your digital twin from the platform is difficult because there isn't anything established to that. So, you're saying this this orchestration is happening on the platform. However, it's going to yeah. be happening in a proprietary way, at least now. And at so at a minimum, we do what we said earlier is, is you know, separate and compartmentalize the, the digital twin on its own, but realize that the second level of this meta, you know, the one level up this higher level construct is still going to be something that's in the platform. So I think this is, you know, the point I'm trying to make, I mean, that's an important point that, um, that I wanted, uh, you know, to be, to be uh, communicated was this is still not, you know, completely portable. But the other point I want to make is you need to have this functionality. If you're choosing yes. a platform, you need it. So when you're choosing a platform, you know, whatever that platform may be, there has to be this idea of taking these digital tw- – first of all, being able to create the digital twins and then having the concept of a digital twin that's not buried like we were talking about earlier within the rest of the middleware, being able to separate it, and then the second part, being able to take these discrete digital twins and being able to orchestrate them. So proprietary exactly. or not – you need this functionality, at least in my point of view. And so the point I'm exactly. trying to make here is I always do call the platform, you know, dumb plumbing. However, right now, because of this, as Dimitri has been explaining, because of where we are in the evolution, there's a really smart part of this plumbing too. <laughs> it may be proprietary, but it's what brings together these digital twins. Anything, any more color to add to that? No, I think you're exactly right. You know, I think we, we said earlier the, the fundamental concept is bundling data and intelligence yeah. that give you those outcomes of the system. And below that, there's a lot of plumbing. Now, uh, one, one closing statement on that is uh, uh, there is going to be an emergence of a standard at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least this is my belief because I do I believe, believe – I do believe that – and the argument for that is that asset manufacturers or equipment manufacturers, over time, that are not shipping their product with a digital twin out of the box will disappear because they will not be able to participate easily in a digital world. Mm-hmm. So that's the major argument for that. Mm-hmm. So that will force that will force that you, know, you buy a, a machine, a non-GE machine, and you will have to be able to plug it, drag and drop into Predix. Otherwise, you know, you, you're not going to be in business because anybody that uses another asset and wants to do something digital with it won't be able to use yours. Dimitri, that was great. Can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and your company? Sure. Yeah, well, you know, we, we're in the digital connected world. So uh, I, you know, I encourage everybody to go on uh, g.com and look at G Digital. So we have a section on the broader G, uh, which is called G Digital. And this is where you can find a lot of information about the Predix platform, uh, Digital Twin. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of stuff over there. Uh, I personally post uh, most of my work on LinkedIn, uh, as well as personal opinion on that. And, uh, and if you want the fun part, I, I actually have a Pinterest board uh, where I actually pin, I'm, I'm pinning every article I get from my Google Alert. So, so if you go on, you go on on Pinterest and, and, and type digital twin, you will find there's just me. There's only one crazy person doing that on Pinterest. So, but uh, I, I have about 65 uh, pins right now. So there's a lot of information over there, and uh, a good sort of them are G. So we're still pretty much leading the sort there. Great. And for everybody, we will put all the links of all the above in the show analysis notes. All right, Dimitri, great conversation. Talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you, Bruce, for having me. Uh, I loved it. And uh, yeah, definitely. Have a great day and let's talk soon. Okay. 
Well, that was episode 84. A pretty good number. Twos and a three and a seven. To get an analysis of this episode, the links, and plus a transcript of the show, go to the show analysis notes. That is a page that's dedicated on iotinc.com to each podcast. And you'll find this one if you just go there and search for it. They can all be found at www.iotinc.com slash podcast. And remember, there's that hyphen between the IoT and the ink. If you've been enjoying the podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every episode delivered right to you. And there are four ways you can support the show. You can refer to it in your blog. You can share it on social. That would be really nice. There's uh, sharing mechanisms on the show analysis notes. You can leave a review on iTunes. Kind of stalled there for a little bit, so it would be nice to get those going. I'm going for that 100 mark. It only takes one click and a little bit longer if you want to write your thoughts. And you can leave a donation via PayPal. Yeah, still there. Haven't really, Actually, I really haven't had the time to deal with it. But I do have a big shout-out for Building Brains, Inc., and an even bigger one to Christian Vidlosher. Thank you very much. Plus, if you have any thoughts on the show, I'd love to hear from you. I can be reached at bruce at iotinc.com. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next time, may your path to IoT business be a cloned one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 